Good morning, everybody. Thanks for being so early here. Uh, today we're going to have 38 events as part of the Latin American Forum, which is unprecedented in the history of the Latin American Forum. We started the forum in the, um, 2010 in Germany, in the rural area. Um, since that time, many things change and uh, many things other things are, you know, stay the same. That is like good, it's a good balance between continuation and innovation. One of the things that are very important for continuation is that two of the speakers that we have today here started with us the process in rule two years ago. Uh, I will start to say thanks to you because you started so early and uh, be part of this adventure. I would like to say thanks to Susan who's here. Uh, it's been one year working email, Skype, and finally we have like a render, you know, real contact, and it's uh, so great to be here and be, you know, welcome, and I would like to say thanks, definitely. Um, probably the most remarkable thing that happened before this day, today, is that one of the goals of the Latin American Forum is to prepare a Latin American country to host ICEA in the future, in the near future. And two days ago, Mexico presented the candidacy to be the host of ICEA in 2015. There are like four candidates, and all of them are great. So we don't know if this is going to happen, but sooner or later this is going to happen. And uh, we will, you know, keep you posted about that. Please enjoy. Today we have an amazing selection of projects, artworks, panels, conferences. And uh, please help us writing, posting information, participating, you know, actively in the panels. This is for you, so enjoy and participate. Thank you very much. Simone Ostoff, the organizer of the panel, Public Conversations with Brazilian Artists and Curators. And sharing the panel with me today is Gisele Beckelman and Priscilla Arantes, who unfortunately could not be here in person, but she will make her presentation via video. I will introduce them both in a minute. But first, I'd like to thank the conference organizers for hosting Isaiah in Albuquerque a region of long connections between the landscape art and technology, as well as a rich Latino culture. I especially would like to thank Andres Burbano for organizing the second Latin American Forum and thus continuing the conversations we started in Germany in 2010. As a way to briefly introduce the panelists, Gisele Begelman, born and based in Sao Paulo, has brought experiences both Brazilian and international to the forefront of art and technology debate. For more than two decades, she participated in conferences and electronic art festivals as an artist, a scholar, a juror, a curator, and she further contributes to the field of media art as an editor, a journalist, and a teacher. Begelman was one of the jurors of ISEA 2012, and she was the curator responsible for the Brazilian presence at the ISEA 2010 in Germany. Her artworks have been presented in prestigious international venues, such as the Zeta KM in Karl, Karlsruhe, the Fundación Telefónica in Madrid, in Buenos Aires, and in Lima, the Sao Paulo Biennale, the Sevilla Biennale, among others. Her curatorial projects include organization of the uh, include organization of the Nokia trends in 2007 and 2008, online video festivals in 2008 and 2010, photography online in 2010. Between 2008 and 2011, Begelman was the artistic director of the Sergio Mota Institute in São Paulo. She is currently a professor in the Art History Design Program of the Universidade de São Paulo. In between 2001 and 2011, she was professor in communications and semiotics of the Pontificia Universidade Católica de São Paulo. Among her publications, I would like to highlight her role as the editor 
of the magazine Select. As you can see here, it was launched, was it this year, Gisele? It was not? Last year. And it's a cutting edge publication focusing on art, culture, and design. It is my pleasure to share the panel with her today as she continuously challenged the fantasy that creative work does not involve theory or research. Priscilla Arantes is a critic, a curator, a professor, and a manager of cultural projects based in Sao Paulo. She has been the director of the Passo das Artes since 2007 and was the program director of the Museum of Image and Sound in Sao Paulo between 2007 and 2010. Adantis teaches art criticism and curatorial practices at the Pontificia Universidade Católica of São Paulo. And among her books, uh, books she authored are Media Art, Perspectives of Digital Aesthetics from 2005, Technological Aesthetics, New Forms of Feeling, 2008, and Crossings, 2010. Among her curatorial works at the Passo das Artes are the Project 5x5, which uh, she will present in the video I'll show you in a few minutes. The goal of this panel is not to approach Brazilian art as a success story. Rather than tracing a history of rising national artists from cura and curators from a marginal past to a successful present, this panel emphasizes decolonial tactics and methodologies that continuously challenge the old center margins binary. I began to write about new media in the 90s, in part because this was a history in the making. In addition, network aesthetics had no centers, only nodes. And much of the media art of the 80s and 90s developed in points of intersections in the cultural hubs distributed around the world. Some of these activities, which were often difficult to locate, I experienced firsthand. And from the start, I chose to write alongside artists and not simply about them. I became especially interested in nonlinear thinking and the topological connections taking place between here and elsewhere. Topology did not have vanishing points. It was not bound by projections or perspective theory in its full kit of ready-made subjects and objects, plans of representation and cones of vision. In the restrictive part of this linear history understood in terms of perspective as a chain of events that unfolds through evolutions and ever new paradigms is the notion of progress, especially of scientific project, of progress. This progressive history generally assumes that the thinkers who stay behind are clearly obsolete. The provocative French thinker and philosopher of science, Michael Serres, is among the critics of, classical, of the classical notion of time. Because for him, contemporary thinking should not be capable, should be capable of multi-temporal relations, at the same time archaic, modern, and futurist. And Serres points out that there are plenty of relevant ideas of thinkers of the past, paths not taken and possibilities unexplored, which can be as insightful and relevant as some contemporary concepts. What is certain is that increasingly, media art is part of mainstream art institutions. An example is the September issue of Art Forum, which celebrates the magazine's 50th anniversary by dedicating the issue to an examination of the relations between art and media over these past 50 years. In this issue, there is uh, an article about William Flusser's column in Art Forum, which he wrote in the 1980s. The article was written by John Reichman, who observed, observed that Flusser is interesting, not so much as a media theorist. A media theorist who examined how technical images were substituting writing and thus bringing about the end of history. Flusser is more interesting in terms of his philosophical journey, which included a number of countries and languages. The focus of his thought was on dialogue and upon an analysis of doubt foundations. This included speculation on language and science, theology and design, philosophy and history, a groundless philosophy largely developed during the three decades Flusser lived in Brazil. And I'll quote from this article. 
Luster's 1960s Brazilian dialogues examine writing and image as a constant bodily provocation of thought. In other words, it is the great Brazilian moment in which Flusser participated that matters for us today because it serves to provincialize Greenberg's style of modernism as the crux around which everything turns. It helped us see New York modernism as only a limited variant in a much more complicated story of writing and image carrying on in many ways and places." Close quotes. The increasing, increasingly international visibility of Brazilian art over the last few decades is not only part of the constant expansion of artistic practices, institutions, and global markets. It is first and foremost the result of critical reflections that are producing a post-periphery era. Contributing in this direction is artist Gisele Begelman and curator Priscilla Arantes. Thank you. To make. <laughs> I could show. Uh, we have a, a Priscilla presentation in video that it's around 30, 30, minutes, minutes. 30 minutes, and we are really in doubt if we present it now or after my talk. I think that now, and then I can Did go. You, talk? Further. Okay. you think that you can Sounds hold? Good. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The sun is hitting the screen directly. How cool is that? <laughs> okay, let's so see. Try to see if you see the numbers. So this project, uh, they started in Sao Paulo at the Passo das Artes. They had the first show, and it's going to unfold over time. So I don't know when it's next. <laughs> uma espécie de mapeamento da produção contemporânea de artistas da América Latina. O projeto surgiu justamente com uma estrutura que a gente desenvolveu como uma análise combinatória. Então, são cinco individuais de cinco artistas diferentes, é, artistas provenientes da Argentina, Colômbia, México, Chile e Brasil. Esse título 5x5 é parte de uma estrutura é, de uma espécie de uma lógica permutacional. Né? A lógica permutacional é um princípio matemático, é, então daí o nome 5x5, que incorpora a ideia de um mesmo, de uma repetição de um mesmo, mas que a cada vez que ela se repete, ela se repete de maneira diferente. Essa não é uma exposição fechada final. Vão acontecer outras nesses outros lugares com uma outra cara, que vai trazer uma outra... É, proposta pro, até o nosso trabalho, a nossa pesquisa curatorial. São cinco exposições que acontecem em cinco países diferentes, onde você sempre tem um artista convidado por nós que conseguimos o projeto. Esse artista convida outros cinco artistas para expor junto e dialogar com o trabalho dele. As figuras e os papéis é, dentro do projeto são intercambiáveis, né? então você tem o artista que é convidado a, também a fazer convites para outros artistas, é, incorporando essa ideia da figura do curador. Na verdade é algo que vem se desenvolvendo na curadoria já há um bom tempo, que é o artista como curador, o curador como um produtor cultural, um agente cultural, então a nossa ideia era justamente é, questionar essas barreiras e desenvolver essa lógica para criar essa, essa rede. Ele não se dá a partir é, do olhar só dos curadores que conceberam o projeto, mas através de uma ideia de rede, de constelação, que vai se agregando a cada exposição é, que acontece. Então essa ideia de rede também, de conexão, de constelação, de pesquisa que se dá em processo através 
de diferentes e diversos olhares, é uma ideia também que faz parte do projeto. Nomear uma exposição projeto é muito interessante, porque justamente traz essa ideia de processo, né? de pesquisa, de investigação, de mapeamento. O cinco também diz respeito à ideia da escolha de cinco temas é, que percorrem é, o projeto como um todo e são temas intercambiáveis, né? quais sejam é, colonização, identidade, história, memória e arquivo. A gente está unindo um museu, a gente está unindo um artista como curador, a Priscila que é teórica, eu que venho desse lado do galerismo, então é muito interessante que são vários braços, né? pessoas com um background é, diferente, é, vendo esse, esse, esse foco central da mostra por diferentes viés. Para mim, o projeto 5x5 tem a importância fundamental de pôr em diálogo a produção artística eh, contemporânea de Brasil em relação ao resto dos países latino-americanos. Eh, normalmente, eh, ou desde a perspectiva que eu tenho conhecimento, eh, a produção artística brasileira está um pouco aislada do resto de Latinoamérica e este projeto tem a missão fundamental de, de, de alguma maneira, integrar e poner em diálogo a produção artística brasileira com o resto de Latinoamérica. Eu, como pesquisadora, como teórica, eu venho trabalhando com um tema no meu pós-doutorado, na minha pesquisa aí pessoal, é, é, com o tema de reescritura da história. Implica na ideia de você entender o processo histórico ou a história não como algo dado e fixo, mas entender a história como algo permutável, é, onde o passado não é algo dado, fechado em si mesmo, mas ele sempre pode ser ressignificado no presente para você ter ações futuras. O Patrick, ele, ele trabalha esses três projetos que fazem parte dessa exposição, né, o Tramar Sul, né, inclusive ele desenvolveu um trabalho específico para essa exposição, né, que é um trabalho inédito, então ele vai trabalhar é, tanto no projeto do submarino, quanto no projeto do trator, com essa ideia é, do roubo do ouro, né, mas que é, fica num depoimento entre um misto de realidade e ficção, né. Yo encontré una nota en un periódico del sur de Chile hace unos 8 o 9 años que me llamó mucho la atención. Esa nota relataba la historia de una pareja de hermanos alemanes que viajaban por el sur de Chile y de Argentina comprando viejos tractores de una marca llamada Lanz. Ellos pagaban mucho dinero en efectivo, en billetes, por estos tractores que eran eh, básicamente chatarra, eran tractores que ya no servían, eran tractores que tenían más de 50 años, digamos, ¿no? En una parte del relato se hablaba de este, de este mito de que los nazis habían fundido oro en los cigüeñales de los tractores, ¿no? Que el nazismo, que los nazistas habían fundido oro para esconder y sacar el oro de Alemania en cigüeñales de tractor y lo habían enviado a las colonias alemanas del sur de Chile y Argentina. Mi trabajo tiene que ver desde siempre con el tema de la economía y con cuestiones sociales. Yo he trabajado mucho con herramientas, eh, con distintos tipos de herramientas, eh, para metaforizar ciertos problemas y ciertos conflictos que existen en el Chile, digamos, de los últimos 20 años. Entonces, el tractor, para mí, como un objeto, como una herramienta de trabajo, fue una cuestión que me llamó mucho la atención, pero también el hecho de que eh, estos tractores fueran enviados a las colonias alemanas en el sur de Chile para trabajar la tierra y que además hubiera oro escondido. O sea, habían una serie de elementos que componían el relato que a mí me llamaron mucho la atención. Ultramar Sur es el nombre de, de la muestra y también es el nombre de la última operación que hicieron los nazis en el mar Pacífico, en el Pacífico del Sur, eh, en la cual eh, fueron enviados, digamos, eh, en submarinos eh, algunos eh, jerarcas nazis, eh, oro y otras cosas que, 
que, que vinieron a descargar aquí al sur. Yo tomé ese nombre como, como una metáfora de, para englobar, digamos, para de alguna manera darle un, un sentido a estos tres proyectos que son el proyecto UBOT, el proyecto LANS y el proyecto Horizonte o el trabajo Horizonte. Para mí lo interesante de estos proyectos que tienen que ver con, con el oro que los nazis eh, supuestamente escondieron en, en el sur de Chile, de Argentina y en algunas otras partes de Sudamérica es que para, para el momento de la colonización, para el momento original de la colonización tanto por los españoles fundamentalmente como para los portugueses eh, Sudamérica era el continente del oro, ¿no? era el continente donde ellos venían a buscar riqueza y ahí está toda la mitología del dorado, etc. ¿no? Entonces, para mí era muy interesante cómo eh, en, este, en estos proyectos el proceso de, de, del oro se invierte y ya no es, digamos, un oro que se viene a buscar a Latinoamérica o a Sudamérica, sino que más bien es un oro que se viene a esconder. Entonces, los tres proyectos... O projeto 5x5 é algo que é extremamente pertinente justamente agora que o Brasil, não, o Brasil está muito em voga, mas consequentemente é, todos esses artistas e essa produção que não é mais embrionária, né? O que se percebe é um deslocamento no campo teórico de uma visão eurocêntrica ou de um privilegiamento de uma produção eurocêntrica ou norte-americana para um, uma preocupação de um olhar também para a produção da América Latina e de países, entre aspas, periféricos. Que é uma produção que tem um corpo de trabalho muito forte é, e, a, e não está mais na margem né, da arte contemporânea hoje. Né? Uma das missões do Passo das Artes é exatamente promover, difundir e abrir espaço para a produção da arte nacional e internacional, da arte eminentemente contemporânea. O Brasil, é, com a Copa do Mundo, as Olimpíadas e essa crise econômica que aconteceu fora e aqui a gente, de uma certa maneira, teoricamente não foi afetado, é, isso obviamente fortaleceu a arte local. Nesse sentido, trazer para o Passo das Artes um projeto né, que exatamente coloca em debate, dar a ver ao público a produção da América Latina, jovem, né, da produção de arte contemporânea da América Latina, inclusive do Brasil, é, dialoga com a missão do Passo das Artes e eu acho que é um prazer o Passo trazer é, esse tipo de produção, não só no sentido de estar difundindo a produção da América Latina e inclusive a produção do nosso país, mas também de trazer um, um trabalho, um projeto é, que pode trazer ao público é, novos questionamentos sobre a história da formação do nosso próprio país. It is very interesting to remember that um, it was in Nicaea Dortmund, it was in 2009, 10, that I first presented a, a concept that I've been developing, that it's the idea of technophagia, technophagy maybe in English, uh, it's difficult to translate sometimes, and um, Uh, recently, I just uh, presented, I was curator of a big show in Sao Paulo and I, the, the main issue, the main concept of the exhibition was technophagia, so it's kind of um, 
uh, not finishing a process, but really beginning a new project. So uh, I, I would prefer to speak in Portuño, actually, <laughs> but I will try to... I can assure you that my Portuguese is wonderful. Uh, it's really wonderful. Uh, but um, let's... It's, yeah. Uh, so, um, the idea was uh, to, of the show was to discuss this idea of technoph technologies, technophagias, and something that I must really uh, reinforce that it's, uh, I don't understand technophagy as a trend or a movement, but it, it is really a personal conceptualization I elaborated to embrace um, some operations regarding the Brazilian new media art production today. Um, I think that the most important, if I would define technophagia, I would say that it is the combination or the tension between cutting edge science and garage science. Mm. And I think this is really what is happening in Brazil today with so many changes in the last 10 years, we have been passing after Lula's government and the emergence of the middle class. So everything is changing a lot. And in some ways, um, the artistic production is rereading this process. And uh, so I would say that this Brazilian production today, it is technophagic because of this combination of um, different repertoires from cutting edge uh, science and garret science. It is autocratic and it is radical. Um, it is um, autocratic and I will really stress this point of view because sometimes from uh, in, um, basically from an aesthetic point of view, everything that is being produced in Brazil today and some works that I will show here that were in this exhibition at Technophagia in Sao Paulo at the Instituto do Miotaki may dialogue with uh, some circuit bending practices and other kinds of approaches that I really understand they, they are related to this uh, a uh, new perspective and new ways of uh, uh, new approaches in the art field. But actually, I think what is really particularly particular to this production is the methodology of their works that it's a kind of vis-a-vis -vis of this age with, of transitory powers, no? um, of Crassia itself, as the Greek would say, and a doc about the here and now, and the way, uh, the way they elaborate their projects um, on the go, on the move, and uh, usually uh, with uh, involving workshops and other kinds of social activities that are not related to art itself. I think that this makes uh, this production a little bit um, different. Uh, so I would say that those, uh, the outlines of form of art that operate through the combining and remodeling of equipment and producing devices able to um, also uh, provide new forms of creation that pave the way to micro-political actions aimed to the appropriation of technology. This is, I think, that it's the main point. The way how they appropriate technology and uh, the way how they give this back to the collective. Um, it's uh, something that really uh, calls my attention also in this production and I think that it's very uh, important to understand uh, and it is very close to the Brazilian situation today. It's this distance from the post-colonial post post discussion and because of the 
uh, new position of Brazil in the global market and in the new economy and the emergence of Brazil. So we became from the state of the uh, underdeveloped and peripheric country for to uh, in really uh, less than 10 years to a global, a very important global player. And this made us some kind of, I think, and especially in the art and cultural field, very close to this notion of radicant that is a concept by Nicolas Bourriot, the French philosopher, and he defines the radicant uh, imports definition from the botanic. Uh, the radical refers actually to an organism able of making its own roots and um, in the process of the of its displacement, like strawberries, like ivies, and this is uh, really the Im the perfect image for me for this new approach to. Uh, Brazilian culture in the global scenario. The way these artists that I will show uh, are dealing with this new global condition without falling in the uh, kind of um, uh, cult of our exotic uh, culture and or in the other side of our precarity and lackness of everything. So I think this is what gives the picture of this production today. And I will show some works that are were in this um, exhibition. There were 15 artists and for me they are all Brazilian, even Rafael Marquette that is Argentinian in fact, uh, but he is a long time in Brazil, but I think that they are all Brazilians because they deal with all those emergent questions about the encounter between and the tensioning between uh, cutting edge science and garbage science, um, the idea of how to uh, this methodology, this edocratic methodology of production and uh, above all this radical posture uh, in front of everything. So um, unfortunately I will not have time to show all the works because it will take us a long time. I will just show some and unfortunately you cannot really see <laughs> the images and they are really powerful. I really feel um, impressed to, to show, but uh, the exhibition combined different generations of artists. That was Arturo Mar, that is one of our pioneers and came from the film tradition and has a very important work that it's called uh, Antropologia da Face Gloriosa, Anthropology of the Glorious Face, that was a series of pictures he made uh, during the carnival in Rio, capturing and focusing the moment of the ecstasy on the avenue. Uh, it was a very difficult series from the 70s with analogic cameras and dealing with all those crowds. And for this exhibition, he developed some patterns that converted this in a multimedia installation of more than 5,000 uh, different uh, combinations of colors and it became another kind of ecstasy. Uh, this is the mechanical schemes. A uh, work that was produced for this exhibition is by the photographer Cassio Vasconcelos who is a uh, master of faking Rio. Um, airport and Siaza, we just saw two fragments this is the airport. This is Seaza, is a big market in Sao Paulo. And they question the transformations in our ways of seeing, uh, uh, introduced by the latest means of, of creating and capturing images. Uh, what interests me is that those images, they discuss uh, at the same time the status of photography as an evidence and at the same time, um, how we embody this point of view from Google Maps. And the combination of the situations, the kind of situations that are aerial views, you cannot see anything really, right? 
I'm just speaking about the yes, <laughs> because there are so many details. Uh, it is a series of pictures uh, made by helicopters and in three days, and then he rebuilds the landscape. So it is really, it's in fact a fake uh, real landscape, because everything in this picture is real, but the assemblage is all produced, mediated by technology, and it disturbs a lot the uh, audience usually, I think that in this one you can see more clearly, uh, it's kind of where is Unsta uh, Wally, uh, where is Wally, everybody trying to figure out is it real or not, because it's so real, and at the same, at the same time it's so impossible. And the same as the airport, that it's a kind of global city today. This is a remix of five different airports, all pictured by Cassio Vasconcelos. He is a, a pilot, but actually when he's uh, acting as a photographer, uh, it's not the same time. And uh, this extremely sophisticated, technology of remounting these landscapes made him really technophagic. Here you can get an idea of the scale of the works that are very interesting. There was a work that was very, uh, from a conceptual point of view, very important and was commissioned for this exhibition that was Einer Country by C.H. Fott, who is a very interesting collective of photographers. And the way we uh, capture the images of a very important film by Glauber Rocha uh, in transit land, land Terra in Transit, uh, that it's one of our main references, and I think one of the closest uh, kind of aesthetics to this discussion of the technology. So the image of Glauber Horsch inside of the exhibition was very important and in fact we did uh, something we call it the Paulistas Beach, Sao Paulo doesn't have uh, sea. Uh, so that was a, uh, open air cinema remixes of Glauber Horsch artworks and this was uh, the exhibition. I will uh, show, I will try to show a video by Dirceu Maues that I think it's one of the most emblematic artists of all those strategies. Uh, Dirceu, he, can you see here? No. Uh, he develops pinhole cameras, they are all handmade cameras, and he develop special cameras for each image that he realizes before he does. And after this, uh, those images are re-digitalized and then uh, converted sometimes in video, sometimes in big prints. And it's really a pity you cannot see how beautiful the cameras are, but um, I will try to show one of his um, videos to get to give an idea of what this this was so captured with uh, matchbox impulse uh, oops <laughs> he uh, developed a series uh, uh, um, a pinhole with, uh, with matchbox and there were more than 1,000 pinhole cameras set around a very important market in Belém do Pará, that it's in the north of Brazil. And so with those cameras, he registered all the mounting and unmounting of the market. And so it's, uh, I will show the video. <laughs>
something, can I keep it running? Because it's so important the images in this presentation. that we are, but it was important to show this kind of work because I think what, are, what is very interesting in Dirceuma ways and why I say he is so emblematic of this kind of production, there is no low tech, no high tech. It's just the appropriation of technology in a, um, uh, in a new aesthetic approach. And so this is the, the new part this is, I think, what is interesting, that we are not discussing technology anymore. We are just using it. And um, also, uh, it is very important, the many, the amount of projects that are really questioning the role of technologies in our lives. So there are two projects that I would, um, give some special attention in this context here. But the Cambiologos are here at ISEA, so I will skip them. They are at the 516 gallery. So um, they have a very interesting approach and the way they develop those works in workshops and everything. Um, but I would uh, call attention to Lucas Bambosi that also is here but not presenting a piece that was produced especially for this exhibition on broken things that was a machine, very beautiful machine, it's, um, that uh, it keeps all the signals from the cell phones in order to put a machine uh, in work to destroy cell phones. So uh, it's uh, the machine captures all, if you turn on the cell phone in the exhibition space, it begins to say uh, there is detected a cell phone in this room. It's very like those airport calls and uh, it begins to move in order to press the cell phones. Uh, this is the way it captures 
the electromagnetic fields, and here is the way it. Yes, and uh, this is the the tube from where the cell phones come, and it's very interesting because it was a kind of cathartic project. There was a lot of media around this project, and also many, many people all the time around. It was like, I think it is cathartic, because it's something that you uh, ever wish it to do, to throw your cell phone and, make, and just smash this. And it was very interesting the way they smashed those cell phones with the input of the cell phones working in the exhibition room. Uh, and another project that I would call your attention, uh, because what I think is interesting in Brazil today is this combination between different kinds of technologies and this uh, real use of technology, appropriation of technology, and not just in the a critical point of view coming from the aesthetics and not more from the discourse about how to use technology. And uh, one of the most delicate works in this exhibition was by Raquel Kogan, uh, XYZ, and this project turns its body in a unique musical instrument. Uh, the rhythm of the music is determined by the heartbeat of the visitor, the pitch uh, by the height and the tonality by the weight of the visitor. Uh, here there is a balance that captures the height. Upstairs, above him, there is a sensor that captures his height. And here is the device um, that captures the heartbeat. And it's amazing how it, uh, let me show you the video. Um, there is a small caption in Portuguese, but I think you will be able to. This is more sound art, so it's not so bad that you cannot see. And so you, sometimes you meet people very stressed coming inside and then you, you hear, uh, you can listen those combinations of samples, very dark and hard. And then comes a child, all fancy and it changes a lot and it can combine eight different body instruments at the same time. There are eight uh, speakers in the room, so uh, they sum up. It's really a very quiet and delicate piece and it was very interesting to have these all together with different other. Uh, we had also 4K, 3D, cinema uh, combined with all those stuff and I think there is, I will finish with this, I think there is a lot um, of uh, I think that anyone of Brazil, you know, of that, of about Brazil uh, today, I would remix um, Oswald de Andrade, that is one of our main <coughs> thinkers and poets, and I would say that only Brazilianity, uh, Brazilianity sets us apart uh, socially, economically, and philosophically. And hereby, I explicitly not only uh, remix Oswald de Andrade, but more precisely his anthropophagic manifesto, where he says that uh, only the anthropophagy uh, keeps us together. 
And I think that today the only thing that keeps us apart is the idea of Brazilianity. Uh, socially, economically, philosophically, so many trends are layering one above the other in, in the country today. I think that those different combinations of works that you could see very briefly, they, they give us a picture of uh, this. Um, and many people, uh, actually various interlocutors associated during the exhibition process, the idea of technology with this of anthropophagy by um, Oswald Jandraji, but uh, in a certain sense, I think obviously those associations are pertinent, but however, um, in the way these artists define their relation to Brazil today, and the idea of the technology in this context, I think it comes closer to another very important Brazilian modernist, Mario Jandraji, and his idea that we are 300, we are 350. This is a very famous poem from him, that we are 300, we are 350. And the various visions and, of, and relations to Brazil stated by artists that participated in this show, I think that they multiply exponentially uh, the remarkable equation stated uh, by Mario Gendraggi. These are visions and perceptions that vary at the same pace in which upon almost every game new coaches uh, are assigned to our national football team. So are so many different visions as are about our national football team. Um, I think that in short what was in question here is, was this idea that happiness is the proof of nine, and that also an idea by Oswald Jandraji. Uh, and I think uh, the main point in the exhibition was not to make a clear picture about Brazil today, something that Simone was introducing in the beginning, but actually to multiply those different uh, kinds of elaborations and also introducing the methodologies of those artists' works in the process of the exhibition. For instance, Gerson Mawes worked with um, Ian, uh, uh, but he did a, a workshop that resulted in some of his cameras, as well as the uh, Gambiologos, Lucas Mafra, Fred Paulino, that are all here, um, came and produced their work, uh, inviting other people to do, and also discussing the main issues of the exhibition in the constant, in, in different contexts that are not the exhibition room itself. So this was the uh, Glauber machine. Uh, we use it to update Glauber Hoche and the idea of the new aesthetics, uh, that it's not a celebration of our precariousness and our uh, exotic exoticism, but um, the idea of how we create uh, the representations of Brazil in the 20th centuries beyond those cliches. So uh, this was the way uh, I think the exhibition summed up all those questions together and in, um, it uh, finished two, one week ago exactly on September 16 uh, and uh, it was a really, really interesting show um, the way it could break some cliches also about what you expect 
when you go to, a, to an exhibition to see new media art. And it's cl come, becoming closer and closer to contemporary art, and I think that in some years we won't need those definitions anymore, since we have already our classics, new media classics, so we were not new anymore. And technology is more a um, political uh, question than an aesthetic discourse. So I think that this all summed up uh, the exhibition and the artist projects. And uh, I think that um, we we can have some conversation now. Uh, unfortunately, I could not see the images. I promised that I will upload this slideshow uh, with the link so you could um, check the how beautiful those works were. And thank you very much for your attention.